remain standing for the reading of the gospel, but I ask you to be seated because it's a little longer of a, a reading this morning. And so um, I also wanted to assure you that for those of you who came in this morning and opened up your uh, Bibles looking for Mark 19, and when you couldn't find it, were panicked that maybe your Bible was wrong, <laughs> it's our fault. Mark 19 does not exist. Um, you should have said Mark 10 instead of Mark 19. And I even put it on the screens last night and didn't even think anything of it. So we're in Mark 10. We're starting a new sermon series this week in which we're going to be looking at questions that were asked of Jesus. And so the concept being that many people came to Christ asking Him very specific questions about life, about things, about stuff, and, and those questions are still very prominent and prevalent, prevalent for us today. And so the first one is, is, as you can see on your bulletin cover, what must I do to inherit life, eternal life? And so this story comes from Mark the 10th chapter beginning with the 17th verse, and here are the words that we find. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all of these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go sell what you have all that you own and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And then come and follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and he went away grieving for he had many possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words, but Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him then, Look, Lord, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age. Houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Again, the, song, the prophet reminds us that though the grass withered and the flower fade, the word of the Lord endures forever. Thanks be to God. Amen. First things first, I want you to take a very deep breath. Because I want to assure you that today is not about money. Okay? So you can let go of that tight grip that you have on your wallet or on your purse. I'm not after your money today. Yeah, you can take your envelope back that you put down there earlier. We do want your money. But this is not primarily focused on money. That's going to come in a few weeks in which we ask the question that the disciples come and, or that the, 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 the people come to Jesus and say, is it right for me to give my, my taxes to Caesar? We'll, we'll talk all about money in a couple of weeks. But this morning, I want us to focus on the question that's behind the question. Because that's the case, right? Nine times out of ten when somebody asks you or brings to you a question that's pretty profound and pretty deep, oftentimes it's the question behind the question behind the question. 
that they're really asking about. And that's sort of the case that we have here with this uh, rich young man who comes to Jesus. It's not really about money. For the, little, for the young man, it is about money. But for the rest of us, it's not really about money at all. It's about all those things that get in the way of us trying to follow Christ. The first thing that needs to be noted about this passage is that this, this young man comes and he kneels before Jesus. Now up until this point in Mark's Gospel, the only people who come and kneel before Jesus are those who need to be healed of a sickness or to have a demon removed from them. All the other cases, these people come and kneel, and yet this rich young ruler comes for a, a, a simple question seeking to know about eternal life, and he kneels. It's almost as if Mark is trying to tell us that this man is suffering from something and needs to be healed. This young man who looks like he has everything put together, and yet he needs to be healed. I mean, this, this young man has done something right because he's wealthy. He's also fairly faithful because he's kept all the commandments up until this point. Now, whether or not he had to report that in order for everybody to know it or if everybody looked at him and saw that in him, we don't really know. But this guy from the outside looking in looks like he's got it all figured out. But yet he still lacks something. We had a harsh reminder this past week about the fact that we never know what someone is facing. We never know what someone's going through inside. And if it takes a comic taking his own life to remind us of that, we had better heed that warning that you just never know what somebody's going through. And so for those of us as people of faith, I would dare say we best err on the side of grace. And friends, as, as United Methodists in particular, as the people who, who call themselves Methodists, who claim to follow John Wesley, who was all about grace, not necessarily some of our other brothers and sisters in the Christian faith believe like we do, but we are all about grace. Grace. And so we had better start treating each other with grace and treating the world around us. It's best to err on the side of grace because you just never know. The second thing we pick out in this passage is that there's two sort of uh, concepts of, of blessings from God that are going on here or, or two uh, ideas associated with the blessings of God in this passage. Firstly, those who were seen as wealthy were seen as blessed. So if somebody came and had an, an inordinate amount of wealth, they were seen to have had done something right or in something to earn God's favor and therefore to have earned all that they had. They were blessed in a, a real way. I don't think that's very different from what we have going on today, is it? We look at people out in the world who have it all, appearing to have it all, and, and we think, man, God's really looked down upon them well. But the second thing that was associated in this situation when it comes to wealth was the idea that resources back then were limited. So if someone had a surplus, it meant that someone else had little. If somebody had a lot, then that meant somebody else, somebody else had little or had less than. I think you can argue that still exists today sometimes when we look out at the world. We look and we see wealth on one side and we see poverty on the other. And so the people were astounded. That's the text that Mark used. That's the word that Mark used. The people were astounded because Jesus was taking this conventional wisdom of its day and turning it on its head. 
The first will be last. The last will be first. It's not about the blessing. This person hasn't done anything right. They put it, they appear like they have it all together. But instead, they, they still lack something. And so I want to suggest to you today that instead of operating out of the idea of scarcity, this is what it comes back to for these folks and still to us today. A lot of the times we operate out of scarcity rather than abundance. And so maybe we should start wrestling with the idea that we have been given a lot. And when Jesus says to us, I came that you may have life and life abundantly. And maybe Jesus actually meant that. So here's what I want you to do. We only do this for a second because I'm afraid you might fall asleep. But I want you to close your eyes. I want you to close your eyes and mentally I want you to go through just your past week. So from this point back seven days, if you will, to, to last Monday, I want you to think of just one, one time, one thing that you can point to and you can say, yes, that was a blessing. It could have been something somebody said, something somebody did. You could view it as, as, a, as a divine intervention into your life or like what most often happens that God inspired somebody else to say something, to do something, to treat you well. And so I want you to think about that. Focus on that just for a second. God, thank you. Thank you for blessing us. Amen. All right, seriously, open your eyes because I'm afraid you might be asleep. Um, do that every day. If you were to do that every day, if you were to close your eyes at the end of the day, right before you fall asleep as you lay down at night, and if you were to make a mental journal of your day, here's what happened, that did this, this, that, did this, and you go through the list, and you can pick out or peg one, one area, one thing that happened that you can say, yes, that was a blessing, a blessing from God. You'll start a journey of living out of abundance rather than out of scarcity. Because every day you're going to have instances. And soon you're going to look back and you're going to close your eyes at night and you're going to go, oh man, there was two. Oh man, there was three. And the next thing you know, the whole of your life is being seen as a blessing from God and the opportunities that you have. But for this young man, and for many people, in our story, the problem was the wealth. It's not money, mind you. Let's, let's be very clear. It's not money. It's instead that the role that it played in his life. The role that the money played in his life. John Wesley, who I alluded to before, had some fairly harsh words to say about how we use our money. In a sermon that he preached called On Money, he says, None can gain by swallowing up his neighbor's substance without gaining the, I'm going to say, wrath of God, because there's some words I really don't want to say with some younger ears in the room. He was pretty harsh about the way we use our money. None can gain by swallowing up his neighbor's substance without gaining the wrath of God. So how we use our money matters. It matters. My professor in, in seminary in, at Divinity School at Duke would often say, we took a church finance class, and he would often say, you show me a, a, a man's checkbook, you show me a woman's checkbook, and I can tell you a lot about their faith journey. I can tell you a lot about their lives just based on where their money goes. And people don't keep checkbooks nowadays, but I, you could show me your bank statement. You could get me online. I could see, we could see a lot about each other by where our money is spent. And notice Jesus didn't say to go give your money to the church. And that's the reason I can say. I mean, I don't want you to take your, your, your <laughs> offering back, Margo, but, but that's the reason I can say with confidence that, that Jesus wasn't saying, hey, go give all the money to the church. No, He said, go and give it to the poor. Because there were some people who were in need. 
Because we're created to be relational beings. We're created to be in relationship with each other. Which means that when we see suffering, that there's something that moves within us and we, and we suffer as well. When we take after Christ, as, as Jesus looked out at the field and He saw the, the people sort of wandering as a, as a, as a sheep without a shepherd, and, and the text tells us that He had compassion for them, meaning he, he suffered with them and were called to do the same. And so when we look out in, into a situation like we're seeing in Ferguson, Missouri, and if we look out with disdain or hatred towards the people who, who do these things or the people who respond these ways, it, it's not, that's not what we're called to be, friends. We're called to have compassion, to suffer with Again, I don't care who you think is right and who you think is wrong in that situation. The way in which I believe Jesus tells us to live our lives is towards compassion to those who are in need. And that includes both. And everyone in between. We suffer with. That's what I wrote about this week is that to break our hearts for what breaks yours, and I know that God's heart's broken this week. And it's okay if yours is broke as well. Because here's the good news. Here's, here's what we're going to hang our hats on as we leave today. And this is the last point. This is the point that's the takeaway for it all. And if you... If you're faithful to reading the upper room, anybody read the upper room this morning? No? You did? Uh, Miriam. Do you know where I'm going? Well, I won't ask you where it was. But the upper room stole my sermon, even though this was written a long time ago, long before I wrote my sermon. The upper room today, here's the thought for the day. We gain eternal life as soon as we believe in and follow Christ. The whole upper room story is about this very question. This is today's, I mean, again, I don't believe in coincidences, but today's lesson in the upper room is all about the sermon that I'm preaching to you right now as far as what it means to have eternal life. And the point is this. You can't save yourself. Only God's grace can. There is not a thing that you and I can do to earn God's favor any more than what God already has. Now this goes against our logic here in this, in this world that we live in, especially this society we find ourselves in, because we have this work ethic that says you've got to work really hard and you're going to earn and you're going to gain and you're going to get to a certain point. And Jesus just simply says that's not the case with God. You can't save yourself. No amount of resources will save you. It's already been done. You see, as Christians, as followers of the one who, 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 who claims to be the Son of God, who, who made that statement long ago, as followers of Jesus, that's already been done through the life of Death and the resurrection of Christ. And it's a gift to be received. So it's sort of a trick question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? The simple answer is to believe. And through believing will be changed. And when we're changed, we'll live differently. And when we live differently, the world around us will be changed as well. So what must I do to inherit eternal life? 
there's probably some things we need to let go of. And then simply to believe. Amen.